the age of 35, we'll say, and you need help after service. Everybody who's between the ages of 13 and 22, raise your hand. Go see them. They can tell you how to use it, okay? Um, and listen, I, I moved myself out of that range, okay? I'm not your expert on this. I just need you to silence it this morning, okay? If it goes off during service, you get to sit right there in that front row. <laughs> I'm kidding, but please silence it. Um, that would be helpful. And then finally, and the most important thing of all here this morning, we've already sort of given them a round of applause. We've got the 10th Hour Project. Woo! We are very excited about that. This is a ministry that has grown very near and dear to my heart. Um, I've had the privilege because of, of, of this body of believers to uh, have the permission to go and to spend time out in New Mexico at the 10th Hour Project. Of course, we sent Tara out there this year, and we're so blessed that uh, a member of our body is a part of that school out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I won't steal any of the thunder of what Pastor Dave might share this morning as far as the details of this ministry, but I can tell you this much, that it is a necessary ministry, one. It is necessary for our, our young adults to have the opportunity to be discipled. Uh, we live in perilous times, and to be a part of a ministry that is geared towards discipling and strengthening the faith of our young adults is absolutely essential, okay? So that's key, this is an important ministry. Um, but it's also a ministry that, is, that, that has some amazing people that are a part of it. And yes, the students, but certainly the leaders of this ministry. And so Pastor Dave and his wife Deanna are an incredible couple. Um, their brother-in-law, Bill James, you guys know Bill. Um, and then his wife, Danielle, is actually Deanna's sister. And so uh, the, the, the testimony of these families and how God has used them uh, the walk of faith, uh, the demonstration of faith, uh, particularly as we're going through Hebrews 11. Uh, I'm not going to give David a big head and say that you know he belongs right there in that hero in the hall of faith, and he wouldn't proclaim that either. But as we read of these individuals and the faith that they demonstrated, listen, I can't help but think of uh, Agents for Christ, Uganda Kids Project, and 10th Hour as just an example to me, a modern day example of those who are walking by faith and just trusting the Lord and living it out. And so I'm confident you'll hear aspects of that here this morning. And I want to also encourage you to take the opportunity after service. Don't run out of here. Take the opportunity to meet the students, talk with the students, things that are going on in their lives. Visit the table out there. They've got a lot of different resources out there. We do support this ministry as a church, but there's always more we can do. And so I'll ask you to prayerfully consider how, you, how the Lord might lead you to be involved with the ministry. This is an awesome opportunity we have to connect with uh, a missions organization. Uh, that we as a body support. And so take full advantage of it today to just get plugged in and to understand more uh, about what they're doing. And so we're blessed to have them here today. I'm going to invite Pastor Dave Chafee to come on up. Let's give him a warm welcome. I'll pray for him. Right, let's, let's pray quick. Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we give you thanks for this day. What a glorious day it is, an opportunity we have, Lord, to worship you to with the breath that is in our lungs give you praise. What a privilege, Lord, it is. And now as we turn our attention to your word, we pray, Lord, give us understanding of it. And I ask, Lord, that you would give a fresh outpouring of your spirit to Pastor Dave. Lord, anoint him. May the word go forth this morning and pierce our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Check, check. Hey. Good morning, church. Good morning. Man, that was an awesome time of worship. Amen. I'm like, can we just go home? My heart is full. <laughs> Praise God. Um, blessed to be here with you this morning. Um, as, as Brandon was saying, we're with a ministry called Agents for Christ. Uh, just a quick recap. We started the ministry about 11 years ago, almost 12 years ago. Um, two families just feeling the, the call to go out and share the gospel across this, um, America. And... Uh, my brother-in-law and I and our family sold everything we owned and got a couple RVs and just hit the road. Not sure what God would do, but trusting Him and wanting to obey Him and His, and his call on our lives. And From there, the ministry just started to grow. Um, we started with just sharing evangelism classes um, in churches all across America. And um, the Lord continued to grow it from there. We started a radio ministry called Evangelism Minute. Just a one-minute encouragement to share the gospel. Um, we started a gospel track ministry, just little cards with the gospel on them. And um, from there, uh, the ministry continued to grow. Um, and after three years of living on the road, just by faith, God provided all that we need. Um, 
my brother-in-law went to Uganda. You guys have all heard Bill, I'm sure, come and share what God is doing over there. What started with two tents on a hill over there um, is now like a city over there. It's incredible what God has done. We started a school. We have over 300 kids in the school. Um, I, I always look at my wife for numbers because I don't know. There's like a lot. Um, there's a lot going on. Talk to my wife. Um, but... Uh, uh, and we, we just built our medical center over there. Our school is expanding so that we've added junior high and pretty soon high school by God's grace. Um, we have a church there, Calvary Chapel Ishunga. Um, there's just, the Lord is just pouring out his spirit over there over the last eight years. And then um, I was on staff at Calvary Chapel Southeast Portland um, for eight years. And over the last year and a half, we have started the 10th hour project. Um, and the 10th hour comes from John chapter one, where we see Jesus' first two disciples, right? Um, they see the Messiah and they follow hard after him. They drop everything they have and they own to follow Jesus. And, um, and, they, and it mentions that it was about the 10th hour. And that's that moment when you say, you know what, I don't need anything else but Jesus. Um, whatever is standing in my way of serving him, uh, I'm going to give up. Amen? Because that's, that's what the call of Jesus is. Whatever you have that is above him or before him or you, you know, added to him, you have to let it all go for the sake of Christ. And if you're broken, you'll understand that that's a good thing to do. <laughs> right? You have to come to that place of brokenness. Uh, but it's been amazing. We had one term, we had six students that first term we came here um, with them and did an evangelism class, and that was a great time out sharing the gospel. Uh, that's how, I think that's how we met Tara. Uh, and, uh, and now Tara's with us second term. We had, we had seven students, students the first term, not six. And we have nine this time, right? Nine? Yes. Guys? Okay. And uh, we've been traveling. We did our first tour. Uh, we went to uh, all the way up to Washington from New Mexico. Um, stopped in Salt Lake, Portland, Longview, Washington, Seattle, then back all the way down through California. Uh, the whole time just encouraging the body uh, to, to uh, get out there, right? To share Jesus Christ and wherever they're at wherever their mission field is, right? When you walk out these doors, it's a mission field, amen? And so um, that's been an awesome time. And then this is our second tour, um, of the first, our second term. And uh, it's been an awesome time uh, just traveling the country. And we're very intentional about everywhere we go, we want to share Jesus. So even if we go to the gas station, um, we, we pray right when we get in the, right when we get, come in the gas station, Lord, there's someone here that needs to hear about you. There's someone here that needs to hear the message of the gospel. And then we get out and go. And um, every, every place we eat, you know, whatever we're doing, we're very intentional. Um, and that's the focus of Ages for Christ is, is to know him and make him known. Amen? That should be all of our intentions is to, to know him and, and to make him known. And so God put it on our hearts to start this, this program. And um, I don't want to call it a program. Really. That's a, you know. It is a project because we're all a project. We're all a work in, in progress. Amen? Amen? And we are all um, in process of learning who Jesus is. But you, as Brennan was saying, we live in, in, a, in a time that is anti-Christ. It is post-Christian. Um, probably more so in where I come from, Portland, Oregon, than here. Uh, you probably a lot, hear a lot more people say praise the Lord here than you would in Portland. Uh, they tell you there is no God there. Uh, but I don't know which is worse, actually. You know, If you have a religious heart or an anti-religious heart, if you're not walking with God, um, you're still missing the mark, amen? amen. And so, uh, it's been an awesome time. These guys um, have a few weeks with us left, about a week, and then they go home for Christmas break, and then they head right to Uganda uh, for three months, uh, living over there, just doing all kinds of different ministry, where it be outreach in the, in the villages, um, helping build um, houses and kitchens for um, widows, and then um, teaching kids English, um, many different aspects, but they get a full, kind of a full range of missional living. I, I call it a hybrid. We're, we're kind of a Bible college, we're also a missional training. And I think the young people of today need that training in their lives. And we've seen huge growth in these guys. It's been a blessing to be with them. Um, the, the family of God continues to expand, amen? Uh, there's so many brothers and sisters that, that we have in this world. And if you ever do a foreign mission trip, it's so beautiful to go overseas to meet your brothers and sisters, and when you worship with them, there's just a kindred spirit immediately. It's so amazing that my family is all over the world because of Christ. Amen? Amen. Um, there's the water here. Well, today I want to talk about discipleship. 
um, because discipleship is important. I, I don't I don't think, uh, especially the church in the West, really has a, quite an understanding of what discipleship is a lot of times. I think we, uh, we've created a culture in Christianity in America and in the West where it's a spectator sport. Uh, people come and hear the word of God and they say, you know, the people that are actually employed by the church, whatever that means, um, they do the work of ministry. Uh, but that's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus commanded, right? He, we are all the hands and feet of Jesus, every one of us. And we all have a call um, to, to a mission. We all have a call to be a part of the body of Christ. And so I want to talk about discipleship today. If you want to turn to Matthew uh, 16. Um, and we'll be starting in verse 24. I'm going to kind of jump around today, but we'll start there. So if you want to take notes, I'm going to be um, referencing a few scriptures today. Uh, but in Matthew 16... Uh, verse 24 um, this is where Jesus of course he had, he had talked to his disciples already about um, about him being killed and crucified and um, of course Peter had rebuked him good old Peter right uh, I'm in my spot here myself <clears throat> sorry and uh, Jesus gives this uh, gives them all an understanding of what discipleship is right here. He says in uh, Matthew 16, 24, he says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word today. Your word is truth. Lord Jesus, we pray that we would be changed by your word today. Um, God, for the church, for the body, may they be moved closer to Jesus. May we shed some of our old self, the world, the flesh, and the devil attacking us constantly. May we be closer to Christ today than we were yesterday, this morning than we were last night. We desire to be made into the image of Christ we don't want to be who we used to be. So for the body, Lord, mold us into the image of Jesus this morning. Lord, for those who might not know you today, that today is the day of salvation, your word says. I pray that they would no longer run. The, your word says that no one, is with, no one has an excuse. That all people know who God is simply by your creation around them. But yet to hear the word of God as well. Uh, may they know there is a Savior who loves them. There is a Savior who came condescended to a manger and to live a lowly life, a humble life, to serve humanity and then go to a cross that he didn't deserve or it should have been me on the cross, it should have been us hanging there for the sins that we have committed against you. That you willingly gave your life for people who rejected you. And you didn't stay dead, you rose from the grave on the third day, conquering sin and death on our behalf. And if we simply put our trust in you, we'll be saved. Oh, what a glorious message. So, Lord, we pray that um, today that you would move in power. Please have your way in us, God. Pray that you'd remove me from the equation, God. Speak through me. If there's anything that you would want me to not say, then I then hold my tongue. Uh, but if there's something you want to add, then do that. And so, Jesus, we just pray that you'd move in power today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, I want to talk about discipleship. I want to talk about five traits of a disciple today. Um, I'm sure there's probably more than that. Maybe um, there's other things that we could think about um, in being a disciple. Um, but I, I laid five out today, and I want to talk about those. Um, Charles Spurgeon said, You cannot be Christ's servant if you are not willing to follow him cross and all, as Jesus showed us in this text. What do you crave? A crown? then it must be a crown of thorns if you are to be like him. Do you want to be lifted up? So you shall, but it be upon a cross. Ours is to die to ourselves. Jesus is giving us a call to come low. Amen? He desires us to come low. I want to talk about that very thing. Now, is there a difference between being a disciple and being a Christian? I would say no. If you are a Christian... 
then you are a disciple of Jesus. And that's what we're talking about here, being a true Christian versus being a religious person, um, a church attender, or a fake. Um, if you are truly a Christian, then you are a disciple of Christ. You've enlisted in his army, and he has things to teach you, to grow you, that you might become more like him. Webster's Dictionary defines this disciple as a person or a pupil or an adherent of, an, of the doctrines of another, a follower. And that is truly what we should be called, right? Followers of Christ. Um, I heard it said that we should be covered in dust that we're so close to the rabbi, right? As he's walking, we're walking right behind it. Um, the Eastern Bible Dictionary says a disciple is uh, one who believes his doctrine, one who rests upon his sacrifice, absorbs his spirit, and imitates his example. I like that. Do you realize that we are all disciples of something? Maybe it's a politician. Maybe a musician. We're all following someone or something. You know, when I was a teacher, or te teacher, when I was a teenager, um, I'm a teacher now, praise God, by his amazing grace. When I was a teenager, I was so big, I was a huge metal fan. I was just, I love metal music, and I was into all kinds of darkness, too, by the way. But I, I just loved guitar players, and everything they did, I wanted to just, you know, I wanted to know everything about them. The strings they used, the amps they used, the effects on their guitars they used. And I wanted to know how they live, why they live that way, and I was a disciple of these guitar players, right? So we're all disciples of something. The Pharisees had disciples. John the Baptist had disciples. Yoda had Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> and Obi-Wan had Luke Skywalker. I think that's correct. I don't know, Star Wars guys. Uh, uh, but the root word of disciple is discipline. And we can probably love that word or hate that word. I used to hate that word. Now I love it. Um, discipline. One, training to act in accordance with rules, drill, or military discipline. Two, activity, exercise, or regimen that develops or improves a skill or training. Three, punishment inflicted by way of correction and training. I've had that, amen? The Lord's taken me to the woodshed a few times. Uh, the rigor of training, effect of experience, adversity, etc. Uh, five, behavior in accordance with rules of conduct, behavior and order maintained by training and control. Listen, without discipleship, we are not disciples, or without discipline, we are not disciples. And if we are not disciples, we are not Christians. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. And this is a man who gave his life for the gospel. He was actually hung in Germany um, for plotting to take out an evil man, Hitler. But he was a man that left his homeland, which was America. He was already here and went back to Germany during a time that was dark and evil because he wanted to serve the Lord with his life. So let's talk about what it truly means to be a, a disciple of Christ. I want to discuss five traits um, of someone who is truly a Christian and a disciple of Jesus himself. The first trait is they are born again. Uh, now you need, you need to remember that Jesus talked about this in John 3.3. 3. Uh, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, remember, he was talking to Nicodemus in chapter 3 about this concept. Now, Nicodemus had come to him at night and wanted to know a little bit more about him. Of course, he was sneaking to see him because, hey, he's a religious leader and he can't let anybody know that he's actually talking to Jesus, right? But he comes and asks him about the kingdom of God. And this is what Jesus tells him. You must be born again. Of course, Nicodemus is like, what are you talking about? Am I going to go back into my mother's womb? You know, how is this going to happen? And he's talking about a, a spiritual birth, right? There must be something that transpires, transforms your heart, where the spirit of the living God comes to live in you, and you're no longer the person he used to be. Jesus was talking about what it takes, what takes place when you invite him into your heart to be your Savior, your Lord, and your Master. See, I think a lot of people like the Savior part. They don't really like the Lord and Master part. But if you're truly broken and repentant, you're going to want him to be your master. You're going to understand that the way you lived your life was not going so well, right? I was on a bad, I was on a bad road, and I wanted someone to help me change that road. And I invited Jesus into my life. 
It is a surrender of your life, your will, your plans, and your all to Him. C.S. Lewis said, Until you have given up yourself to Him, you will not have a real self. Think about that. You're not really you until you're actually born again by the Spirit of the living God. All of us are separated from God by sin. And there's only one way, one way to be forgiven and become who you truly meant to be. It is the place we truly find life. Before we receive Jesus, we are walking dead people. We walked around dead and we were controlled by selfish desire and filled with death because of sin. Ephesians 2.1 and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Listen, that's when that moment of surrender comes, when you taste the grace of God. Have you tasted it in your own life? Have you tasted that forgiveness and that grace? That's when life begins, when it truly begins. John 1 uh, tells us in verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but the will of God. Have you been born of God? Has he come into your life and changed your life? so that you know that you know that you're saved. This is the first step in being a Christian, but it's clearly not the last. Uh, listen, you don't say some, just some sinner's prayer. We talk about that in our evangelism class, that, that just saying a prayer doesn't save you. It's actually inviting the living God into your life. You can say words all day long, but if they're not from the heart, if they're not a truly repentant heart, they don't mean anything. How many people in the, in the West, especially in America, Think that, well, I said this one thing this one time, and so therefore I'm going to heaven. That Listen, that's the beginning of a relationship. You think about this. I use this scenario all the time. Imagine you were getting married, right? You and your significant other are so excited, and that day comes, and you get married. You have your wedding night, and the next day, you wake up, and your spouse is gone. And their clothes are gone, packed up, and left. And you're wondering, what in the world happen. You don't know where they went. You can't find them. And then 10 years later, they come, you hear a knock on the door. You open the door and they come walking in, grab a Coke out of the fridge. Hey, babe, what's up? And sit on the couch. You would be like, what are you doing? What, who are, what are you doing here? Where'd you go? What, what happened? Listen, the Bible says that many will say, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name. We did that in your name. And Jesus says the scariest words I've ever heard, depart from me. I never knew you. Listen, God wants a relationship with us. He desires to know us. We must be born again. It is the only way that you'll find strength to live for Him. Without the Spirit coming into your life, um, you, you cannot live for God. You'll spend your life trying, 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 and feeling defeated every single time because you think, I can't do enough to earn His love, and you're missing the mark. That's because it comes in surrender. It's not when you say, Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, when you say, Lord, I can't. That's where it begins. I can't do this, Lord. Fill me, change me. It's the only way to understand the Bible. Without the Spirit, it's just a book. I've had many people say, I've read the, the Bible, you know, cover to cover, and I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, without the Spirit, you're just going to misinterpret it. Think of all the cults that exist in our, in our world today. You've got Mormons, right? You've got Jehovah's Witness, and many others who twist the Word of God and add to it or subtract from it, um, and they don't have the Spirit of the living God in them to understand it, to interpret it correctly. Without the Spirit, you can. We won't get it unless we meet the author of the book. Each one of us need to meet him personally. It's the only way to heaven. You have to be born again to enter heaven. Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's only Jesus that can save us. <coughs> You must be born again to inherit everlasting life. That life begins here and now, not just when we die. You should be experiencing eternal life today, folks. If you're His child, you should experience it every day. The grace of God in your life. The mercy of God in your life. When you take that first breath in the morning, thank you, Jesus. 
that you're in my life. Thank you that you love me. Without the spiritual change, you will not be his disciple. <clears throat> the second trait of a disciple is they're a student of the word. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourself approved of God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When you are truly a disciple or a Christian, you will study the Bible and you'll love God's word. It will become alive to you. I remember when I got saved, how God's word became alive to me. It was suddenly I just couldn't stop reading it. I wanted to read more. I wanted to read more about Jesus. Even before I was saved, when I started reading the words of Christ, man, I was blown away. I had all these misconceptions about who Jesus was. I had all these ideas about God, and they were totally wrong. Right? Because the enemy was just lying to me, lying to me, trying to keep me away from his word. But once I was born again, man, I, I couldn't stop reading it. I just desired it. Paul, writing to Timothy, he told him in 2 Timothy 3.15, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Listen, you want to hear God speak? This book right here. Amen. I went to a worship concert once, um, and the band was leading worship. They never once opened the Bible. They never once read any scripture. And they kept saying, show us your heart, God. Show us your heart. We want to know your heart. Help us see your heart. I'm like, Are you, is someone going to open a Bible? Because <laughs> he's shown you his heart. His heart is in his word. It's his love letter to you. It's his road map. It's his instruction manual for you. That's what God desires. He desires you to know it. The Bible should shape how we look at everything. Have anyone heard the word worldview? Uh, some people, ha everyone has one, and most people don't know they have one. But it's the lens that you see things through. We study worldview uh, a lot in the 10th Hour Project because I want these guys to understand that everything you watch, everything you listen to, everything you allow into your eyes and your ears, um, there's a view, there's a, there's a worldview there, there's a system of thinking. And we need to understand and interpret and filter everything that we do through the Word of God. The other thing about studying God's Word is we, if, is we do it even when we don't feel like it. That's part of being a disciple and being disciplined. I was talking to my son the other day who lives in Portland, um, and he was talking about this very thing. He's saying, Dad, do you read the Word when you don't want to? I'm like, of course. <laughs> I think I'm going to always want to. He said, well, I was talking to somebody about, I, I'm trying to be regimented about reading the Word every morning. I, I need to read it. I need to read it. And, and his, one of his friends was saying, oh, you don't, you don't have to read the Word of God. Like, don't be religious. Uh, don't think that it's, you know what I mean? You have to do this. Um, just allow the Spirit to lead you when to read, when not to read. I'm thinking, what? This is crazy talk. <laughs> uh, God would desire you to read it every, way, every day and listen, it's not out of a God's going to love me more right? because God's love is infinitely the same His agape love is with you when you're in the pit and when you're on the top of the mountain His love is still with you Amen. no matter where you're at when you're in depression, anxiety, fear or you're at the top of the world serving God, hands lifted His love is still the same for you Amen? And so we need to hide God's word in our hearts to understand that. We need to hide God's word in our, in our hearts so that we might live according to him because he's our hero. He's our father. We want to please him. We want to love him. And so he was saying, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> As we were talking, he's like, I, I didn't think that was right. You know, and I, I was trying to tell them that. But they, I think they were trying to avoid being religious you know, about it. But listen, that's not religious. To read your word every day. Um, there's certain things about doing something religiously, that might be good, right? And that's reading God's word. Um, I heard a, a pastor, Ray Comfort, he was talking about that one time. He said, you'll be reading through the word of God, and sometimes it feels like, oh, it's just like apple pie, so good. It tastes great, you know? He goes, other times it's like Brussels sprouts. And he's like, yeah, you know, you're chewing through Deuteronomy or something. It's like, ah, I know I gotta read this. But, you know, I'm having trouble. But I like Brussels sprouts. So, you know, but, but uh, 
the whole word of God, right? The whole counsel is what we read from cover to cover. And all of it is, is for our benefit. And if you're struggling to read the Bible, ask God to give you a love for it. Um, like the psalmist, um, Psalm 119, verse 8. It says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in, the, in your law. David is asking God to help him understand it, that he will find all that God has for him in it. At times we struggle through it. Um, we must press on and be disciplined in reading the Bible if we want to have victory over Satan and live a godly life. Amen? Amen. Stick to his word. Read his word. Sometimes you, maybe you don't have time in the morning. Maybe it's the afternoon. Maybe it's lunch. Maybe it's on break at work. What, just get it. Get into God's word and get God's word into you. Amen? <laughs> wow. I can't tell you what God's word means to me. It's just such a joy to read it and to live it out. And we've been studying it with these guys. Every morning we do our devotions together. It's, a, it's the richest time. It's so much fruitful time. It's a blessing to study his word and allow it to break us down. Um, now the third trait of a disciple is uh, they apply the word to their life. Um, we live by the Word of God. Uh, what you say and what you do, right, is according to the Word of God. Um, we're not fake, right? Some, you know, I call them priesters, right? The people that come to church on Christmas and Easter. Um, that's it. Amen, brother. Hallelujah. i got to get back to the public game and slam my bottle of JD, right? But on Sunday, hey, man, I'm there. got my tie on. It's all good. And it's a hypocritical lifestyle. Amen? But we apply the Word of God to how we live. Uh, because we're born again, and we want to. <laughs> uh, listen, the greatest cause of atheism is people who claim to be a Christian and don't have anything to do with Jesus, right? They don't live for God. Uh, that's the greatest cause of atheism in this world. Uh, many people that we, when we go out on the street, we talk to people, they left the church. Why? Hypocrisy, right? Granted, we're all going to fail. We're all going to blow it. Uh, but you know what? I think that's an opportunity to show that you love God is because you can go back to somebody and say, I blew it. I think that my greatest witness, especially when I was working a secular job, was to go to my coworkers when I failed and tell them I failed and I need to repent and I'm sorry. Of course, they thought I was crazy because they're not Christians. They're like, what are you talking about? And I said, I said this or I did this. We all do that. Dave, like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't do that. I, don't, I try to live you know, for the Lord, so I'm sorry, man. I need, I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. And they might not get it, but hey, it helps them see that I'm a broken human in need of a Savior. You know, and it helps them understand Christianity a little bit better. So we want to be people of the word, but we want to be real as well. Uh, the disciples, disciples will be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Psalm 119.11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. How often when we're studying the word of God and we're out doing something, and maybe something triggers a sin in our lives, and we go, oh man, the word of God comes back. And... You know, there's a rebuke there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Or it might be an encouragement. I'm down in the pit, and here comes God's word, reminding me. I'm his child. He loves me. He's for me, not against me. I'm seated in the heavenlies with Christ. I have every spiritual blessing because of Jesus. Hide his word in your heart. James 1.21 says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But, but be doers of the word, and not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, and goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and continues in it, and is not forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I love that he talks about the law being the law of liberty. Listen, the, Jesus' commandments are not burdensome for us, are they? It's like, please tell me what to do, Lord. I'm a, mess, I'm a messed up sinner. And if I do it my way, it's going to be a wreck. But if I listen to you, I know that I'll be on the path of righteousness. So I love his word, and I want to look into the perfect law of liberty and find that hope and find that instruction. Listen, conviction without action is useless. Conviction without action is useless. 
Some people come to church and they get really convicted by the Word of God. Like, oh man, that was a convicting message today. Man, wasn't that convicting? Oh, it's convicting. Ah, oh, man, I feel bad. Sometimes people just like to feel bad because it makes them feel good. It's like, I feel bad about that. No, God's Word is wanting you to feel bad. There's a difference between conviction and guilt, right? Guilt will push you away from God and you'll run and hide. Conviction leads you to the cross. Like, Lord, I want to change. I see this place in my heart that's not after you. I desire it to change. And the only place we can find change is on our knees, right? Change me, Lord, because I can't change. Uh, allow his word to change you. Allow his word to do that. But listen, the, the definition of sanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, right? And how often we just get convicted, then we get convicted again, we get convicted again. Listen, you want the medicine to change that, to, act, to put action behind that? Get on your knees. Confess that place that's not changing and watch his spirit do it in you. Amen? The fourth trait of a disciple of Jesus is they are becoming more like Jesus every day or they're being conformed to his likeness. Romans 8.29 For whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son that he might be <clears throat> excuse me, the firstborn among many brethren. As you follow Jesus, you start to become more like him. Um, this might be slow lived, right? <laughs> All of us can say, I, I don't think I'm walking on water tomorrow. I don't know about you, but I'm not, I don't know if I'm about to do that. Um, he, said, he said in John 13, 15, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. He wants us to live as he lived. Jesus is the reflection of God the Father, right? He came down. He, he came down to this earth to show us the Father's heart that we might live after his example. The way you act toward others and talk to, to others will be more like Jesus every day as you study and pray for the Lord to change you. Listen, when I got saved, um, I had a lot of bad habits. I, I had a lot of things in my life that were totally messed up. I had a lot of addictions. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I had nothing to do with Christianity or anything like that. And I, I needed to change. And so I wanted to be like Jesus. As I read his word, I'm like, man, I want to be like Jesus. He loves people. He's graceful. He's kind. He's considerate. He lays hands on the sick and they are healed. He hangs out with people that are in pain and suffering and he, he loves them. And I desire to be more like that, don't you? I want to be more like Jesus. Um, but I didn't change overnight. Um, and I didn't change. Uh, there was a lot of things that I'm still working on. I mean, we're all a work in progress. Uh, but I noticed over the years that things that, I, that were ch choking me out, habits and things that were in my life are no longer a stronghold in my life. That God, through His Spirit, has broken those things in my life. And I can look back and say, thank you, Lord, that I'm not that man anymore. And I'm not that person who I used to be. I'm not who I'm going to be, but I'm not who I was for sure. And we're still in process and learning to overcome sin. Amen? Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Lord desires to change us, to transform us. And as he does that in your mind, your actions will follow. Your mind is renewed when you, you let God's word change you by the power of his spirit living in you. Amen? Amen. Allowing his, his word to change you. Listen, when you're praying, when you're studying God's word, spend some time just sitting still and being quiet. So often we're just bringing those petitions. Lord, and this happened, this happened, this happened. Listen, he'll listen. He's there. He loves you. He's ready to hear all our petitions. But the, uh, during um, last summer when we were pre prepping and praying, I, I was like, okay, i got to get in the Word. I, got, you know, I was waking up in the morning, got my coffee, and get in the Word. i got to do this, this. I'm thinking all these lists you know, and all these things. And the Lord said, be quiet. <laughs> and, I'm like, what you? and he said, put down your Bible. I'm like, i got to study the Word, Lord. i got to get And he said, I, just be quiet and sit down and listen. You know? And it was in that moment that God just gave me a peace. It's this shalom peace, just, you know, his spirit just washing over me, saying, I have you in the palm of my hands. I love you. I desire to help you. Just let me do that. 
Amen? Amen. I was just getting caught up. Not, not the things that I was doing bad. They were just, I was just caught up in them, you know? Um, doing the work for the sake of the work. Um, and I had to just slow down and allow God to speak to me. Um, the fifth trait, the last trait of a disciple of Jesus, is they, will, they are a witness. You'll be a witness for Jesus. When Jesus has truly changed your life, you are going to tell people about it, bottom line. This is going to happen in your life. If Christ has changed you, if he is your hero, man, how can you not tell him about, how can you not tell others about what he's done? Acts 1.8 But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Listen, in the book of Acts, when the church met, they were waiting on the power of God to come, right? And he told them, I would come, and I'll send this, the, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon them and radically changed them and turned them into bold witnesses, right? You shall be my witness. Listen, you can experience God in many different ways. We come into church, and we worship God, and we lift our hands, and we experience God, many of us, Right? When you get up in the morning and whatever time you're reading His Word, and you study His Word, you experience God, right? There's, a, there's this power of the Holy Spirit that comes in your life. But listen, I can't tell you, if you haven't experienced it, the power that comes upon you when you're His witness, right? You go out and you talk, you purposely set in your mind, in your heart, I'm going to talk to someone about Jesus today. And He gives you words that you didn't think you had. He gives you scriptures that you didn't think you, you, you had, right? Brandon talks about this all the time in his part of the class. He talks about boldness. And when we're out in the streets, just talking to people, God will give you scripture. He'll give you things that you've hidden in your heart you didn't remember. And all of a sudden it comes forth and you're like, oh my gosh. And you go home praising God. It doesn't matter what happened. Maybe someone got mad at you. Maybe they got saved. I mean, praise God. That's the best, that's the best thing. Is when someone comes to the living God um, through you. That the Holy Spirit uses you to bring someone to Christ. Listen, that's the best thing thing ever. But even if they reject you, I'd go home praising God that you planted the word in their heart. He'll be your hero. You'll be his witness. You'll end up sharing Jesus, what Jesus has done in you. And you'll be excited to talk about it. Jesus again talks about sharing your faith in Matthew 5.14. Uh, he says this, You are a light to the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do, the, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Listen, just by the way you act and live, it's going to give you an opportunity to share the gospel. Let your light shine. I met a lady one time I was sharing the gospel and this lady got mad at me and she's like, that's a private thing. That's a private thing. And I thought, well, according to Matthew, we're supposed to share with the whole world, right? <laughs> Go into all the world. And, um, but people have this idea that you just keep that to yourself. I can't. I'm sorry. You know, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel, right? Like Paul said, I have to tell somebody about the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Um, have anybody, any of you guys seen Faith Like Potatoes? You ever seen that movie? That's a really good movie if you haven't seen it. It's about a man in Africa um, who is just a, he's a messed up dude. He's a drunk. It's a true story. Um, and he ends up giving his life to Christ and Christ radically changes his life. But there's a scene when he comes to Christ um, and he brings his whole family to the altar and he gets saved and then he meets with the pastor uh, afterwards. And he's telling, he's telling the pastor, like, man, I'm changed. Like, something happened to me. And he says, this is amazing. And I don't know. I just feel free. And I'm, I don't have any more burdens. And um, he said, that's because you've been born again. And the Spirit of God has come to live inside of you. And you're excited to experience that. And he says, now I want you to go and tell three people about what I've done to you, what the Lord has done to you today. Right? And he's just like, oh, shoot. Like, <laughs> are you sure about that? I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, and I, those of you who have seen the movie, and then he's heading down the street and there's the bar where he always drinks and he's got his little Bible and he's just like, oh no, like, do I go in there? And he's like, chicken's out, right? He's about to bail and one of his buddies that's going to the bar is like, hey man, what are you doing? Come on in, let's get a beer, you know? And so then the Lord puts him on the spot and he has to tell him like, 
yeah, I'm saved, man. He's like, what? You know, what are you talking about? I'm a Christian. Like, God changed my life. You know, but God will put you in that situation. If you, especially if you want it, he's like, Lord, please bring me those opportunities. And what happens? He brings them, and you're like, oh, not right now, Lord. This is like a bad, you know. It always happens at a time when you think, I don't really want to do it right now. Uh, but his, he will bring those opportunities to be a witness. Um, G. Campbell Morgan said this. He said, uh, to call a man evangelical who is not evangel evangelistic is an utter contradiction. To call a man evangelical who is not evangelistic is an utter contradiction. Why do we call ourselves evangelical Christians if we're not being evangelists? Listen, you don't have to have the gift of evangelism to do the work of one. Amen? Even if you don't have that gift, allow God to use you. Let your life open the opportunities to share what he's done in you. Now these are five, the five traits of, of, of a Christian life and what a Christian should look like. They are what happens in a person's life when they have met Jesus in a personal way. One, disciples are born again. Two, disciples, a disciple is a student of the Word of God. Three, they apply the Word of God to their life. Uh, four, they're becoming more like Jesus. He's transforming their life um, into His likeness. And five, they are a witness for Him. The question is, are you missing any of these traits in your life? Then you need to get alone with God and ask Him to help you walk it out. Are you missing some of these traits in your life? Ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart um, if you're missing some of these in your life. God wants to do, work all of these things in us. And listen, I don't want to ever preach a moral gospel, right? I think that's a, that's a poison in, in Christianity is that if I do this, then God does this. If I work harder, then God loves me more. If I, you know, and you got all the rules that you set for yourself. Listen, the, the first, the rule is I can't. I can't do this, Lord. And it's surrender to the, to the Father to say, I can't do this, Lord. Fill me with your presence and change me. Um, and allow Him to do that work in your life. Um, or maybe you're missing all of these traits. Is it possible that you've believed your own idea of what the gospel is? of what Christianity is. You formed an idol in your, in your mind and in your heart. Uh, or maybe you've walked away from the truth for a false gospel that allows you to live however you want. Listen, we, we want to live a certain way, but it's only by His power in us. Right? But the gospel is not a, a license to sin. Christianity is not a license to sin. Second um, Peter uh, 1, starting in verse 5, says... But also for this very reason, giving all diligence and add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be... You, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. If this is you, then you're more likely, you're, you're likely either A, not a disciple or a Christian, and you need to meet Jesus in a real way. You need to be born again. Surrender your life to Him to be set free. Or maybe you're just backsliding, you're struggling in an area and you need to come back to the Savior. Um, listen, all of us are a work in progress and we need to examine our hearts. He goes on in verse 10, Therefore, brethren, if even, if even more, uh, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For... For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? We'll be welcomed into His arms if we simply give our lives to Him. And all of these things that we've been talking about today will be added to your life as you surrender your heart to Him. Do you want to be a, a disciple of Jesus? Do you want to be His hands and feet? Do you want to be the person that is filled with joy and peace and love? It all comes from, it comes down on your knees, right? It comes through the cross. 
It comes from letting go of yourself and saying, Lord, I want you to, to be the, the, the master of my life. And from there, you'll see all of these, all of these fruits come to be. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we just want to say thank you for your great grace. Lord, I thank you for um, being here in this church. I thank you for this body, just the love they have um, for us. I thank you, God, for um, all that you're doing here. And Lord, I pray for every soul in this place, um, for the disciples here, Lord, for the Christians here that love you. Um, may we all examine our hearts and say, where are we at, Lord? The things that need to change that we might be more disciplined in our life of following you by your power and by your strength in our lives and in our hearts. We desire that, God. We ask you to come and fill us, Lord, and help us to be um, your representatives in the world. Help us to walk as you walked um, by your strength. Jesus, I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you, that they wouldn't miss the opportunity to give their life to you today. That they would surrender their life. They'd realize that outside of you there is no hope. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would be even believe in him would not perish. Not perish, not die a death that leads to second death. But have everlasting life and have it more abundantly today. I pray for any soul that's here that doesn't know that that hope, that peace, that they would surrender their life to you, just say simply, Jesus, come into my life, change me, forgive me, heal me. And you'll do just that, for your word declares to us that you will. So God, we give you glory uh, this morning and praise. And we thank you for your grace, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Church, I want to say thank you for, um, just for your love and for having us here. Um, we have a table out there uh, with our ministry. You're welcome to sign up for our newsletter. Um, our greatest need is prayer, but we always need uh, financial partners too, whether five, ten, whatever you can do. Um, uh, we have a monthly subscription to coffee. We just started selling a Ugandan coffee. So my, actually my son and another uh, one of the interns is starting a coffee ministry, and we're hoping to start that up to fund the ministry as well. You can sponsor a child in many different ways, but uh, your prayers are always needed, and I, we feel them. We know that this church prays for us, and we're blessed. And we're blessed by Pastor Brennan, his wife, and his family, and just you guys. Um, there's a special place here. Um, we feel it, and we love you guys. So God bless you, and uh, thanks for having us. Let's worship. Amen. <laughs> stuck out today and in, in, in John in chapter 6 and Jesus the disciples have been have been walking with Jesus for really a short period of time and and ministry started to get real and Jesus started to really proclaim who he was who he is and what that means that cost of discipleship and it was about that time that many turned away it was about that time that many said no it's not for me <laughs> 